All right, welcome everybody. I'm so glad you could be here today. Um, I am Melissa McKay. I am partnering with Michael Lieberman today. Um, we're going to talk to you a little bit about some security stuff. Um, my section is going to be primarily from a developer standpoint. How many of you are developers out there? Okay, awesome. How many of you are like security experts? Okay, yeah, nobody wants to admit it, right? Yeah, <laughs> I know how that is. All right, um, so we're, we divided this up into two pieces. I'm going to talk more about um, the problem statement, and then I'm going to scare you all. Um, and then Michael will come in and save us with some actual uh, solutions and thoughts about how we can do better in this field. Um, I am currently a developer advocate for JFrog. My background is uh, in the Java backend side, and a lot of this part of my talk is from my experience as a developer just coming into the security side of things and realizing, oh, there's a lot more here than I realized. And um, I'm Mike. Uh, I'm co-founder of Kusari, a software supply chain security company, also an OpenSSF um, governing board and TAC member, as well as a maintainer of uh, Salsa, Guac, and various other uh, open source tools. All right, how many of you recognize this page? Yeah? All right, my very first job as an expert security person, that's a joke, by the way, um, was to uh, obfuscate this page. And I had no idea why. I was just told to do it. It was, it was uh, put in JIRA. I was told to add it, um, make sure that no one could get access to this page. And I started asking questions. And of course, it's because it revealed the version number of our Apache server that we were running. Now, why would we care about that? Well, it just so happened that at that time, not this version, but at that time, there was a version that was not so good. It could be attacked easily. And we didn't want to reveal that to either our customers or to anyone else trying to get into our systems. So not obviously not the best way to deal with security, but that was my intro. And obviously, we can all agree downtime is a bad thing. It costs money. Um, the money is involved in both loss of revenue as well as uh, possible reparations required for customers. I'm going to breeze through a couple of famous hacks that I think you're all aware of. <laughs> it's the beginnings, the beginnings of an S bomb. <laughs> All right, I think we're all familiar with this one, the Equifax, Equifax breach. It uh, happened March through July of 2017. $1.4 billion in cleanup costs and $1.38 billion in consumer claims. That's 143 million customers that were affected. And of course, this was the Apache Struts vulnerability that we all love and adore. Um, log for shell this is, you know, even aged, but it's still out there. <laughs> and uh, we still need to be concerned with it. Um, 70,000 open source projects used Log4j as a direct dependency. 174,000 used it as a transitive dependency. Uh, one thing I would like to mention here is maybe there were some of these projects that even though they had this library in their systems, maybe it wasn't really applicable for them. But how could we really tell? We need these tools to be able to let us know if our code is actually following the path that causes us to um, have a, a breach or a weakness in our applications. So here's a page I go to regularly. How many of you have received the letters in the mail that says, your data has been exposed? How many of you have received multiple letters in the mail? <laughs> yeah, same. Same, um, this site I go to, it's updated regularly, and even just this year, uh, it was last updated March 21st, six data breaches have happened in January, February, and March of this year. And I pulled up a few of them um, just because they highlight a particular problem that we have with our code bases. Um, last year, in the middle of the year, there were three pretty big hacks that involved the uh, Move It software written by Progress. And this was just a matter of a, a piece of software getting in there that had um, you know, a problem with it, uh, an interesting attack vector. It had a malicious component. And a lot of people were affected. Um, the one I was most interested in were, uh, I'm from Colorado. That's where I'm based, in Denver. Um, so that last one, August 11th, the uh, data breach. 
I got a letter in the mail for that one. It's estimated that the global average cost of a data breach in 2023 was $4.45 million. There's a lot of money involved in this. Um, this is based off of the IBM report uh, last year, cost of a data breach. And so as a developer, my first concern is why is this happening over and over uh, repeatedly? And um, I feel like as a developer, I should be able to handle some of this. I should be able to write code that is secure. This seems like a reasonable statement, right? If all of us developers get together and make sure that our code is hardened, we should be okay. There's lots of resources out there. Uh, OWASP has really good resources. I found this essay, it's a joke, but I, it was hilarious if you love you know, this kind of thing. It's exactly the opposite of what to do on how to write uh, secure software. Uh, there's a lot of uh, advice in here that you should not take. And one in particular uh, really, uh, I think, stands out to me as a developer because even though this seems silly, uh, relying on security checks done elsewhere, this is very, very common to do, especially when you're new to a team, you're getting onboarded, you're kind of isolated, you might be focused on your specific features, these bugs that, that you care about, and you might just be trusting that further down the line that if there's something wrong with your code, someone's going to tell you about it, right? So we rely heavily on security teams. Um, sometimes we clash a little bit with security teams, but often we take for granted that someone else is taking care of this problem. So let's talk about developer education. I was really lucky to be involved with a company that decided to invest in us. Um, they put us through some courses. They hired a third party uh, education company to do this for us. And I learned all kinds of things. I learned about cross-site scripting, learned about SQL injection, LDAP injection, uh, cross-site forgery request, insecure cryptographic storage, all these things. And I really, really did think that I was solid at this point, that I knew my stuff, I, my code was gonna be okay, that it was gonna be hardened, and we could all move forward and live in a world where we don't get these letters in the mail. But unfortunately, there's a lot more to our projects than the, the code that we write. There's a lot of other code that other people write and code that we might not ever see or look at or be involved in um, the PRs for it or even know what's in there. We just count on the fact that these are things, these are libraries, these are packages that we can use in order to further our own tools and software to get ahead of the game. None of us really want to reinvent the wheel. So this is a, you know, it's very valuable to be able to pull in, you know, for example, open source projects uh, that meet a specific need of ours and be able to move forward with that. Turns out about 70 to 90% of code bases out there use open source uh, projects. This is one project I was using just as a demo uh, with a partner of mine. Uh, it was a microservices project. There were seven uh, individual components and this was in Java and I just quickly did a Maven tree just to see what all kinds of dependencies were involved in this particular project. And it turns out there were 114 direct and indirect dependencies, but look at how many layers deep that is. This is dependencies of dependencies of dependencies, right? It's a lot to keep track of now, and that's, this is only going to get worse as we move forward. So let's look at this statement again. As a developer, it is my responsibility to write code that is secure. This is still true. There's still a responsibility here but I think we're now coming to understand this is a little bit naive. There's more that needs to happen. And let's talk about some other problems we might see with dependencies. The sheer number of dependencies is not the only issue. Um, here's an example of a dependency confusion attack. Um, this was written about by Alex Burson. He had a really good blog on this on medium.com a few years ago. And it turns out that uh, this particular project was a, a JavaScript project. It has a list of dependencies here. And you can see that the ones that are uh, highlighted in yellow, these are actually private packages that were supposed to be internal to the company. And you can also see that the versions of those packages have that little caret in front, meaning that you need to get 
you're, you're expecting to get either that version or a later version in order to keep up with updates that have been happening in this code base. Turns out, when you run npm install, um, these package names are not secret. Uh, when you pull packages from npm, for example, which is the default, um, it informs on these package names. So what does this do? Let's go through a simple example, very contrived. Um, you're expecting to get version 1.2 or later of your corporate library. You're expecting this version to be the latest. However, in the public NPM repo, you now have a higher version that someone has maliciously put out there to trick you into getting. By default, you're going to grab that version because it is the latest and greatest, right? And now we have a problem. So one way to uh, address this is to make sure that if you do have internal libraries that you rely on, uh, make sure that you block those requests to public repositories. Make sure that you get what you expect internally rather than what someone else wants you to get externally. All right, XKCD is my absolute favorite cartoon. I've already seen this one in particular and other slide decks, very famous. Um, this is more to do with not necessarily a malicious package, but vulnerable in that it is not maintained by more than one person. There is a, a problem here. If, if something happens to that one little package that you rely on, you're going to suffer dearly. And one example of this is the left pad incident. Anyone know what that one was about? Do you remember when that happened? Yeah? Were you involved in trying to fix that or figuring out? <laughs> yeah, you just, you just saw it. I think most of us did. Basically, uh, there was a developer out there de that developed a package named Kick. And Kick happens to be also an organization name. And the organization Kick wanted to have their package named Kick. Well, they couldn't come to an agreement, so they decided to go to NPM to figure out what to do. NPM sided with the Kick organization under the idea that when someone pulls a package from NPM, they need to get what they expect. And if there's already a organization name called Kick, that's probably what they're going to expect to get. Unfortunately, the developer did not agree with this decision, um, was upset, and decided to go ahead and remove his package completely from the NPM repo. But not only did he remove the Kick package, he removed 272 other packages, and one of these was LeftPad. There were a ton of projects that were dependent on LeftPad. Fortunately, another developer came in, recognized the issue when all these builds were breaking, and went ahead and stepped in and published a identical version of LeftPad, but he labeled it version 1.0.0. As best practice, a lot of projects were explicitly asking for version 0.0.3, which doesn't exist anymore. So still problems. What was super interesting about this is here's the code for LeftPad. That's it. That's what caused all of this to happen. Um, on March 22nd, uh, things kind of blew up. So good example of you know, making sure that when you do pull in open source packages, that you're paying attention to whether they're being maintained. All right, so this is a little aside, but how many of you like Rube Goldberg machines? I love them, along with jigsaw puzzles and all those things, but occasionally I run into a, a cool Rube Goldberg machine like in an airport or something. Um, I know my rec center back home where I grew up had a really cool one that I could just stand and stare at for hours. Love this stuff. Um, one interesting fact about Rube Goldberg, he's the only person whose name is in the Merriam-Webster dictionary as an adjective. So if you want to be famous, this is something to strive for. I'm going to see um, a Melissa McKay someday is going to be an adjective. I'm not sure what it's going to mean yet, but we'll get there. Um, just a quick Google search, I wanted to see what the largest uh, Rube Goldberg machine was, and it turns out there was a video posted December 10th, 2021. This whole machine that you see here took 4 minutes, 26 seconds. It made the Guinness Book of World Records. It had 427 steps. Do you see where we're going here with this? It's a little bit of a metaphor with software and how we put our software together, how we compose it, all of the pieces and parts that we put together. And the biggest point I want to make here is I was a developer. I was often just in the code. Then I joined a DevOps team. 
Now I had all of these other tools, all of these other pieces and parts that needed to be put together, including the build machine. Um, and see how happy these people are at the end of this here? That's how happy I was when I got my first Jenkins pipeline running. Okay, all of these dependency issues, they're just one problem. There are lots of other gaps, clearly, that become evident when you really look at all of the processes that are involved in getting your software to production. And now I'm gonna pass it to Michael. He's going to give us some solutions. Uh, hopefully, hopefully. Um, so yeah, actually before getting into the solutions, I was there during the left pad situation. I was there very late at night trying to fix our production site that had very heavily relied on left pad and trying to make sure that we could fork it and then oh, it, was a, it was a whole mess. Um, so software is a Rube Goldberg machine, so is security. So this is a um, what I call the security sandwich, open source security sandwich. It's a bunch of tools in the open source space, mostly open SSF and CNCF uh, related tools. And I'll go into a lot of these today. Um, and hopefully in the future, we can work to simplify this and make it more straightforward for the average person, make it less of a Rube Goldberg machine, um, make it more uh, simple uh, to use. But what folks are, uh, one of the um, key issues with security today is it involves both producer, software producers, and software consumers, right? As a software, you know, I've, how many of you are producing open source software today? All right, so about 20%. How many of you are consuming open source software? Pretty much everybody, right? So you can't consume open source software securely if people are not producing open source software securely. And the problem is, Producing open source software securely is difficult. It's not straightforward. There's a lot of practices. There's a lot of burden on maintainers. There's all this great stuff that, that we need to kind of figure out. So what we need to focus on is how do we get the data in the hands of the people who need it when they need it? If we look at the top there, there's a bunch of different stuff around um, software producer-focused producer security. So these are things like Salsa, Scorecard, and I'll go into all this, Witness. At the bottom, we have stuff that's consumer-focused, so stuff to help you as an end user say, hey, is, does this package look secure? Is it doing the right things? And then in the middle is sort of how do you get that data to the people, right? There's all this data that's potentially being produced by maintainers, things like SBOMs and Salsa statements and all this stuff that describes the security of these projects. Um, but how do you get it in there? That's where you know, we have tools like Guac, tools like uh, OSV and, and all sorts of other stuff. And then on the left-hand side, is so if the right-hand side is the sandwich, the left-hand side is the rules for making that sandwich. So these are things like SigStore, and we'll get into this a little bit. Um, things like SigStore that are focused on, uh, you know, signing and and things like Git Tough, which are focused on Git security and that sort of thing. Let's take a look at another view real quickly of this. Once again, it's kind of complicated. This is a list of all the OpenSSF projects and working groups and where they're sort of focused on in the SDLC. And there's a ton of stuff in here, right? You know, there's projects that are focused on securing the source, projects like Salsa that are focused on securing the build, um, projects like Alpha uh, Omega that are focused on, you know, um, just the overall, you know, critical projects, and all sorts of other stuff in here. Um, it's complicated, right? You know, you as an end user might come in and say, which of these projects do I, should I be looking at? And, you know, I already have enough on my plate, and then also the other problem, right, is software maintainers are coming in and saying, all right, I'm being asked to do front end, and I'm being asked to do back end, I'm being asked to know databases, I'm being asked to do DevOps, I'm being asked now to do security, and it's not just a little piece of security, there's all these projects I now need to figure out. So let's take a step back, right? Let's look at this in, a, in the simpler cases, right? This comes from the Salsa website. This is how we sort of look at um, you know, supply chain attacks. So, all of these uh, letters at the top are all potential attack vectors, right? 
your so, you know, somebody who is writing code, their laptop can get compromised. Somebody, your source repository could get compromised, you know, bad permission, something like that. Your build could pull the wrong source, right? And this is for both internal folks uh, who are running their own company or also people who are developing uh, software in the open source space. Uh, you could pull in, once again, one of these dependencies that's malicious, typo-squatted, vulnerable. That's kind of D over there. And, uh, you know, your, when you go to actually publish the package, right, there's dependency confusion and all of that sort of stuff where, hey, the wrong package actually got published uh, uh, there. Um, and, uh, you know, a malicious package could have gotten published by a malicious actor with your credentials or even a developer who decides, hey, look, uh, somebody paid me a lot of money. I'm going to upload a malicious package, right? And then at the end of it, the consumer can pull down the wrong package, pull down the wrong version of a package, get confused, pull it from the wrong website, all that sort of stuff. So how do some of these tools begin to fix this, right? So the producer side of stuff, that top level of the sandwich I showed, right, which includes stuff like Salsa, All-Star, Git Tough, Scorecard, and all sorts of other stuff, focus on, on protecting the producer side of things, right? So, um, so, uh, it, like, for example, Salsa is, is focused right now for 1.0 is focused on provenance of the build. So did I pull the, you know, uh, source code from the right place? Did I do, uh, and actually not did I pull it from the right place? Am I recording the information about where I pulled it from? Is the build, uh, you know, is the build signing metadata about uh, what it did? Um, and also, who has access to those secrets to do the signing? Because you don't want to end up in a, um, anybody remember SolarWinds, right? Um, that was, they had one key, that key had gotten compromised, so now everything was being signed, and it looked like it was actually coming from the official build process, as opposed to, you know, um, identifying that actually uh, 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 a malicious library was injected into the build process. All right, so this is being, um, you know, secured in order to protect this, right? You want to protect the packaging and the consuming of those packages, and that, that's where we use all sorts of tools and, you know, services and all sorts of other stuff like Guac, which we'll talk about in a little bit, um, S2C2F, which are, you know, set of requirements around safely consuming uh, open source software. So if, for example, folks are using Salsa, great. S2C2F is like, use, you know, ingest the Salsa. If, let's say, folks are not using Salsa, what can you do to sort of mitigate that? For example, run, maybe run the open source build yourself. Don't trust the public version of that package. If the, if, if the scorecard score says they're not running SAST, maybe you run the SAST scans yourself. And OSV is a, um, both a, an open source, uh, uh, schema underneath the OpenSSF, as well as a, a public service, I think, put on by Google that uh, tries to also distribute uh, open source vulnerability data. So now um, that we looked at, so now that we looked at what it looks like in the breadth perspective, what does this look like securing this from a depth perspective, right? So it's, it's not enough to just kind of do those things. You need to understand what it actually achieves, right? So at the end of the day, what you're trying to do is you're trying to associate where stuff came from and what to do about it. And you can't do that if you don't have signatures against that, right? If you don't have a way of associating identities, like the user who published this package or the system that built this package, then can you really trust where it came from, right? Because anything could, any number of things can go wrong. Next up is Salsa, right, and, and in Toto. Um, this is stuff like, hey, are you signing your SBOM? Are you generating metadata about how this thing was built and then signing it with things like Sigstore? Then you need to have a way of aggregating and analyzing all of that data to be able to make, you know, to, to understand that. That's where things like Guac come in to download all that sort of stuff. And then finally, you need to then say, hey, I need to have automation, I need to have policies around what are the things I'm worried about to make sure I only pull in the things that 
let's say, have a salsa attestation, that have a salsa attestation I trust, that have an SBOM that you know, doesn't have a known vulnerability, that sort of stuff. So let's look at what some of these tools are um, a bit more. So the foundation here, right? So that was, um, you know, th by the foundation, this is sort of the base level of things you could be doing. You could be using in Toto layouts, which once again are like rules for the SDLC. It's rules for what, how a thing should be built. You should be using stuff like uh, Tuff, which is a way of distributing, uh, safely updating, distributing a package and knowing who is supposed to be distributing that package, right? This is for if you're, let's say, a, a maintainer here. Um, GitTuff is also rules for what is allowed to be done in, the, in a Git repository. You could think of it as similar to GitHub rules, but actually enforced at the, at, at Git, at the um, inside of Git as opposed to in any particular uh, uh, software server, uh, in any particular repo server. And then SigStore is, you know, you're assigning essentially the identities to all the stuff inside of your, our, your, your SDLC. Great, uh, so attestations, right? You have in total attestations, which are metadata claims about the SDLC and supply chain. And those metadata claims are once again associated with an identity by, uh, you know, through something like SigStore. Salsa is rules for securely providing provenance about software, and that's communicated primarily through those in total attestations. Um, SBOMs, right? It's composition of software. Uh, scorecard is the security posture of the project, right? OSV is vulnerability metadata, and OpenVex are like exceptions um, or, you know, exceptions about that metadata. Uh, sorry, exceptions about the software you have. So, for example, is this thing actually vulnerable to this, um, to this, uh, 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 vulnerable to a particular uh, vulnerability? Right, so now uh, Guac is the thing that then is sort of at that aggregation and synthesis level. So Guac is a knowledge graph of software metadata to answer security and supply chain questions. Okay, for folks who are maybe don't care that it's a knowledge graph, what is it really? Hey, it's observability for the software supply chain, right? It provides the analysis, uh, it provides the capability to do the analysis you need to figure out what is actually in my software supply chain. So you're pulling in all this data from places like deps.dev, you're pulling in SBOMs, both SPDX and Cyclone DX, you're pulling in metadata about OpenSSF scorecard, uh, various vulnerability information, threat intelligence, all that great stuff, and you're pulling it in and you're turning it into uh, a database that can be queried. And um, a level down there, right, is by taking all of this software from your own organization and understanding what those dependencies are, as well as the open, uh, as well as open source software and pulling in all those dependencies, you can begin to identify two main things, right? What do you know about your software? That includes the open source software you pull in. And what do you not know? Which is in some cases just as important, right? Do you have an SBOM for this? Have you seen this software before? Right? If you haven't seen the software before, maybe it's one of those typo squatted things. Maybe it's a, you know, a dependency confusion attack. Right? Have you seen this sort of thing before? And that helps you uh, analyze and ask the questions about, uh, 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 you know, ask questions about uh, the software you have. Um, and so that leads to sort of, hopefully, here, the end goal, right? which is by doing policy and insight, right? which this is where Okay, great. I have all this data. Let's assume I trust it right now because it's been signed via SIG store with identities I trust. What can I do? Well, you can begin to actually apply automation here. So there's various tools um, that integrate with Guac, uh, which takes that supply chain security data and can apply it to, for example, a key Verno check or uh, an open policy agent check. Right? There are tools like the Salsa verifiers that can actually verify the claims made by Salsa attestation. So for example, hey, if a Salsa attestation claims it was built inside of GitHub and it check, does it have a valid, um, you know, if, if we go back to the cert, does that cert, uh, can that be traced back to the OIDC token that was associated with the GitHub action that built that software? Uh, if no, then you know something's gone very wrong. Um, and it can also verify some other stuff in, inside of the GitHub action as well. S2C2F are the rules around 
um, you know, checking if packages followed the best practices, and it also has the mitigating controls around the ones that might not be. And if you, let's say, use data from sources like those attestations or via Guac, you can essentially say, okay, great, do I have this SBOM that this check says I should have? If not, what do I do about it, right? Um, and then finally, yeah, you can use policy as code, and there's various ones like, you know, that, that are out there that can be sort of integrated into this whole process. Quick point here, uh, you know, Guac is not quite 1.0 yet, but it's moving to 1.0, should be uh, uh, stabilized soon. Um, so the big things on the roadmap for, for Guac are stabilizing the API, enriching the REST API, uh, doing some uh, backend finalization. Um, we're almost done with SBOM diff functionality, and we're building out uh, some protobom integrations. And uh, I don't know if folks saw the announcement about SPDX3. That's also probably something we were going to be adding in there as well. Okay, and so what can you do? Um, both maintainers of open source projects, folks who are interested in maintaining open source projects, folks who are just interested in getting involved, learning more, hey, come, come join us, right, uh, in the OpenSSF and CNCF, and, and just generally in open source. Um, so uh, I recommend checking the, the calendar for each of these. Um, so, uh, but at a very high level, the security tool belt SIG is focused on taking all those various things that we just showed and making it simpler for both maintainers and end users, right? Don't want maintainers to have to get in there uh, if they don't need to. We don't want to have end users have to understand all those various things if we don't need to. We want to be able to provide them mechanisms to just, you know, hey, I can just use this tool and that pulls in all the other stuff I need, right? Um, Salsa, right? That's a, there's a group there, Providence for Software Producers, S2C2F, Practices for, for Ingesting Software, and, and all that sort of stuff. So anyway, uh, come join us uh, in the CNCF. Uh, there's also, you know, in Toto and Tuff. That's where things like um, Witness and Archive Vista also live. Um, and yeah, uh, you know, come help out. I just want to point out how important that is. So many of these projects didn't even exist a few years ago, right? So please look at these, add them to your pool, toolbox, and provide feedback. You all know what happens to guacamole when you just let it sit, <laughs> okay? This is what happens to projects if we don't get involved. And it's important that we all um, have our opinions, we all have our use case scenarios that we need to get in there out front and center so we can help fix these problems. Yeah, and now we're gonna open it up for questions. Uh, going to be a little more technical than stuff you've gotten into so far, uh, but I did pull down <coughs> the Guac code base uh, and took a look at some of the stuff, and I noticed that you are using Neo4j as one of the persistent backends. Oh, uh, is this off? Hello? No, no. Okay. Yeah, uh, I noticed you're using Neo4j as one of the persistent backends, and I was wondering if there was any plans to add Gremlin support uh, for the backend. Um, so we actually more or less removed Neo4j um, from support just because the license uh, not great. Uh, um, so we looked at Gremlin support. Uh, there's a lot of stuff kind of going on on that end that uh, didn't want to get into just because of, of like certain projects had been abandoned, other projects are spinning back up. It's still definitely something that we could consider in the future. Right now, one of the things that we've done is uh, we've moved over to ENT, ENT, which is an ORM um, uh, that supports sort of GraphQL and is, is intended for sort of like GraphQL. And, and so right now, the main backend that we're supporting is SQL. Um, and we found, at least during our current tests, performs about as well as, as any graph database we've seen. Um, we haven't tested it out with very, very heavily nested graphs yet, but but um, it's worked pretty well for us so far. So uh, Guac can sit on top of uh, SBOM repositories um, because it, it's essentially trying to create a graph, right? Um, so what does, uh, are there integrations uh, planned uh, for any SBOM repositories? I know Cyclone DX is one as a repository. And then from Wind River yesterday, we heard about their own uh, homegrown uh, database called Catalog. Uh, so 
are there planned integrations? Yeah, we have um, several integrations in there already. So, for example, we can support um, we can support things like S3 buckets. We can support or other cloud buckets. We can support file systems. We can support um, uh, uh, like, uh, for example, throwing it onto an event stream and having us pull it in that way. So there's there's lots of different integrations there, um, you know, uh, as well. So yeah, any of that should should work. If if for example there is something specific that you know won't work, it wouldn't be that difficult to to um, uh, you know add that feature. So if there's one in particular that you're looking for, or or if there's a bunch that you're looking for, feel free to open up an issue in the the repo and we can take a look. Uh, you, oh, where's where's the state get stored? Yeah, so it's now in Postgres. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it, it could support other SQL as well. The one that we're planning to support is Postgres because um, we found it to be uh, you know pretty efficient. <laughs> um, when it comes to the bomb diff feature that you're talking about. Um, do we do you support some sort of internal like normalization because uh, it it's possible when you have like multiple tools involved you're going to have different names for the same component so how do you handle that in guac yeah i think that's actually just the problem with s bombs right now um, even though there's two standards almost every single tool has their own standard <laughs> really um, different tools will support different um, optional uh, parameters, uh, uh, optional uh, fields, and then even among those fields, right, some of those fields will have different semantic meaning depending on how it's been populated and, and some of that. Um, so right now, I think it's going to be a little naive, but I think over time, the thing that we plan to also do with some of this great open source work is to go back to SPDX, Cyclone DX, and say, hey, here are the things we're running into. Maybe for the next version, can we make this a little bit more specific? Or go to some of the tools that are generating this and saying, hey, we, ran, we saw two SBOMs for the same package, and they look completely different. Obviously, one or two, or in most cases, probably both are wrong. <laughs> Sure. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, Guac is an open source project, so yeah, like, come open up an issue uh, if there's like something specific, and then also the one of the key things is we want to work to both support like normalization, but we also want to um, support like, or, or sorry, if you have a specific uh, normalization, and you know, we want to have some ability to like include also you know uh, implementation specific metadata or whatever, but we do want to keep it as standard as we can because we want more folks to be starting to apply like the rules consistently so that so that the entire ecosystem can kind of uh, benefit from that. Um, how are you thinking about names of packages and how you refer to you know this is this you know so uh, do you have a scheme for canonical naming of packages? Uh, that's that's the million dollar question there. Um, yeah. So so uh, uh, what what we do is we look right now mostly at the package URL, but we found obviously package URL can be as general or as specific as um, as you uh, uh, you know it can be it can be hyper general. Like you could just say, hey, I have this version of this package, and you're like, well. There's multiple different distributions of that package, so what is this really? Um, you know, and there's also even the case of, hey, uh, even a hash can sometimes be insufficient because if you don't have reproducible builds, um, you have the you might have two packages that are essentially identical. There's nothing really different between them, but they technically have different hashes. And so, more or less, we just keep all that data, and then based on the way you query, you can say, hey, look, this is how I want to query it because I actually view these two things to be the same, so I'm going to ignore the hash or whatever. I think we have time for maybe one more question. All right. Great. I hope you leave here hungry for more. And um, have a great rest of your day. Thanks. Thank you.